join our free WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. Listen to the conversation between John, who is an accommodation officer for overseas students, and Susan, a Canadian student who wants an apartment, and complete the form. Look at questions one to five on the form now. Hi, Students Housing Office. I'm John. Can I help you? Hi, I hope so. I need an apartment. The sooner the better. My friends suggested I try you guys. Well, that's what we're here for, the famous Students Housing Office. By the way, we call apartments flats here. Anyway, let's get started. First, I'll take down a few particulars to put in our database. Hopefully, we'll help you find some digs before term starts. Some what? Some digs. That's British slang for rented accommodation. Oh dear, flats, digs, and I'm an English major. No problem. But back to business. Okay, family name. Cartier. Cartier. Sounds French. Yeah, my ancestors were French. Wow. Do you speak French? I was born and raised in Montreal, so I'm bilingual. That's great. And your given names? Susan Marie. That's M A R I E. Got it. Nationality? Canadian, I guess. Right. And your student number? C A O four six two eight. Okay. Got a contact number? It's six five three four nine zero eight seven. I'm staying with friends until I find a place of my own. Six five three four nine one eight seven. No, nine zero eight seven. Got it. What about a mobile phone? I'll get one later today and tell you the number. Okay, six five three. That's way over the other side of town, right? Yes, near the railway station. Far too far if I have classes every day. So you want somewhere closer? Up to half an hour by bike and with a bus service if the weather is too bad. Yeah, I cycle here too. Keeps me fit and no hassle trying to find a parking space. Do you want to share accommodation or live on your own? Live alone. I'll be too busy with my studies to bother with roommates. How much rent do you want to pay? Around five hundred pounds a month. Look at questions six to ten. Now listen to more of the conversation between John and Susan, and answer questions six to ten. That's about right, but it won't be very big. Would a bed sitter be okay? A bed sitter? More British English for you. It's a single room with cooking facilities. Some are quite nice. That'll be okay, but I don't want to share a bathroom, and it must be clean, bright, and not by a noisy main road. Okay, but you've come a bit late. With only four days to go before the term starts, we've only got shared accommodation on our files at the moment. But don't worry, we'll do our best. Oh, I forgot. Does the rent here include utilities? Usually, no. You have to pay the gas, electricity, and water yourself. What about a deposit? Most landlords want three months in advance, which is also a security deposit. And make sure you read the rental contract carefully, especially the small print. Thanks, I'll do that. Anything else you need to know? Not at the moment. Make sure you let me know your mobile phone number. Will do. Anyway, I must go now. I'm meeting some friends in the cafeteria. Okay, we'll be in touch.
Bye for now. See you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear an introduction to a library by George Martin, who is the head librarian. First look at questions 11 to 16. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 16. Good morning, and welcome to the main library of the University of British Columbia. My name is George Martin, and I'm the head librarian. And happy to give you a brief introduction to our library. I guess I'm qualified. I've been working here since 1961, back in the days when the only electrical or electronic stuff here was the lights. Oh, and the phones, of course. Mechanical typewriters and slide rules, then. No fancy laptops and cell phones. Computers? In a library? No way. Everything was on paper. If you needed to find something, you went to the card index. And if that didn't help, you asked one of the staff. And if that didn't work, you told your professor that you couldn't write the essay because the library didn't have the book you needed. My, you students have it so easy nowadays. We've got about 15 computer terminals on each of our four floors. If you know the title or the author, then you can find out if we've got it in seconds, and, if we do, where it is. If we haven't got it, then you can find out if the public libraries and other university libraries in Vancouver and Barnaby have it. Now you know that library books are arranged according to the numbers on the back of each book. Does anyone know the name of this numbering system? Right, the Dewey Decimal Classification System, which was invented by Melville Dewey, an American librarian, not John Dewey, the philosopher. Now look at questions 17 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. In Melville's day, book classification systems were in a real mess, so he decided to do something about it, and around 1876 came up with the system we still use today. Look up there, and you can see a list of basic categories. 000, generalities, which includes all sorts of things encyclopedias, news media, etc., etc. Then a hundred, philosophy and psychology. Two hundred, religion. Three hundred, social sciences. And so on, up to nine hundred, geography and history. With over four million books, actually nearer to five million now in our library, we have a lot to thank Melville for. Now, if you look up to your right, you can see the layout of the library. It's very logical. We start down here on the first floor, or the ground floor for our British cousins, with three zeros, generalities, and so on up to the fourth floor with all the 800s and 900s. By the way, you won't find books on medicine and dentistry here. They're all over in the me medical library, just to the east of the medical school. Now, if you look at the plan of the second floor, you can see we have a CD and DVD library. The music collection covers just about everything that we call serious, from Bach and Beethoven, folk music, blues, early rock and roll, jazz and more.
but sorry, no punk, heavy metal, rap or hip-hop yet. For oriental music like Peking Opera, you'll have to go to the Asian Studies Centre or Chinatown. A word about taking books out. The usual lending period is two weeks, but a few books in great demand can only be taken out for two days. And I suggest you try to return books on time. The fine is a dollar a day for the first week and a dollar a day thereafter. That's a lot of beer money. One last thing. Your fancy new smart student card is also your library card, and you can also use it to pay at the student cafeteria. So don't lose it, or you'll starve to death without any library books. OK, I guess that's enough here. Let's move up to the second floor. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between Jack and Mary, who are two college students. They are talking about the courses they should take. First, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 26. You now have some time to read questions 21 to 26. Hi, Mary. Got time for a coffee? I'd love to discuss what courses I should take. I'm so confused. So am I. But maybe we can work something out together, Jack. We should really talk about this with our academic supervisor. But she's away until Thursday, which might make it a bit late to register for some of the more popular courses. That's my worry. It's lucky we're doing the same major. So some of the courses will be the same and we can cycle in together. What did your parents say when you told them? You would be an English major. Well, Dad thinks I'm crazy. You'll never find a decent job when you graduate. Teacher or secretary, that's about all you'll be good for. But he's an engineer, so what would he know? What about your mom? Oh, she loves reading and has dreams of me becoming a great writer or something. So she's all for it. What about your parents? Actually, they agree. They're both teachers and are always moaning about the terrible English of most of their students. They blame it on computers, computer games, to be exact. Very few of their students ever read novels. Anyway, let's have a look at some of these courses. I thought of taking Latin. People say it'll train my brain and help with French and Spanish as well as English. I think that's nonsense. It's a dead language. If you want to learn Spanish or Italian or something, then learn it directly. I did Latin at high school, and apart from helping me guess the meaning of some of new words with a Latin root, it was a waste of time. Leave Latin to archaeologists and theologians. Guess you're right. Okay, no Latin. Actually, I'm playing with the idea of doing journalism later. Foreign languages are always useful for a journalist. Maybe I'll take oral French. As the conversation continues, answer questions 27 to 30. You now have some time to read questions 27 to 30. That's exactly what I was thinking. What are the lecture times? Let me see. French 100, 9 to 12 Monday mornings in language lab number 2, and 2 till 5 Thursday afternoons in lecture hall A5. I think they're both in the arts faculty building. They are. I checked the language lab out yesterday. Very modern and not too big. Room for about 30, so the teacher will have more time for individuals. Not like that 50-seat place in my old school. 
Okay, French 100 it is. What next? I was thinking about Creative Writing 201. What do you think? That's one of our set courses, stupid. We have to take it along with History of English, Early American Literature, and Sociology 100. Damn, I forgot. So including French, we'll be doing five courses this term. How many classroom hours is that all together? Let's see. History of English, three hours every Tuesday morning. American Lit, two till five Tuesday afternoons. Creative Writing, nine till twelve Wednesday mornings. Sociology, two till five Friday afternoons. That makes 18, including three hours in the language lab. Sounds enough to me, especially in our first term. And the times won't interfere with my swimming team training. All work, no play makes Jack a dull boy. You certainly need that creative writing course. Let's drink our coffee. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture about environment and development by Professor John Robertson. You now have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all looking so refreshed after spending the weekend testing the beer in the student's bar. I wonder if any of you discovered the library, but I guess it's far too early for that. It's even better to see we have a full house. I hope you are all here for Environment and Development 101, because if you are not, then you are in the wrong lecture hall. By the way, my name is John Robertson, and I'll be the main lecturer for this course. But we will have some guest lecturers from time to time. And nobody has left. Great. I guess that means you all intend to take this course. Okay. As it says on the notice outside, today I'm going to describe the main contents and purposes of the course and, hopefully, add to the enthusiasm that brought you here today. Does anybody know who Howard Odom was? Right? He is known as the father of ecology. He once said, Everything is connected to everything else. And that statement explains the design of this course. As human knowledge expands, most courses, even first-year courses, get more and more specialized. You learn more and more about less and less. This course is quite different. This course is quite different. In the 72 hours of this course, don't forget you get two credits for it instead of the usual one. We will try to achieve three main objectives. Namely, we will try to get an understanding of what is happening to planet Earth, why it is happening, and hopefully to find some answers to the many problems that we'll be talking about. The first few lectures will be an overview of the more serious current trends that are of such great concern to, not just greenies, meaning environmentalists like myself, 
and organizations like Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth, but also to more and more ordinary people and even a few politicians and corporate leaders. So we'll be looking at things like global warming, the loss of, in particular, tropical forests, persistent organic chemicals, known as gender benders, because they can seriously affect the sexual development of animals, desertification, the serious worldwide problem of overfishing, and the accelerating loss of biodiversity. If humans carry on as they are, some 50% of the world's plant and animal species will be probably extinct by the middle of this century. That's the environment bit. What about development? We'll be thinking a lot about this issue. If the goal of development is to improve the quality of life, which presumably means making people happier, then we have to think about this thing called happiness. In modern times, we have become consumers in the great consumer society. Are we any happier than the bushmen of the Kalahari Desert in southern Africa? And if common sense tells us that rising sea levels, gender benders, and all the other aspects of a worsening environment will sooner or later put a big break on consumption. Why? Given the warnings from the great majority of the world's scientists, are things in general continuing to get worse? This brings us on to psychology, sociology, and, of course, politics, economics, and even philosophy. We won't have time to go into each of these areas in great depth. For our immediate purposes, this is not necessary, because the basic goal is to help us develop a model, a dynamic model, that integrates the main forces leading to environmental degradation and those opposing forces that promote environmental stewardship. This is a tall order for us to do as individuals, so we'll be dividing into teams, and each team will focus on one or two particular aspects, at the same time integrating the main findings and arguments of the other teams into their work. Well, we have a lot of great work to do, which means it's coffee time. Back in 15 minutes. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.